would prefer if you had a copy of the South View Spirit as well. The other things you want to have will be your communion elements, because later in the service, we will be partaking of communion with you. So if you need any or all of those things, you can just press pause right now, get everything in place, and once you've got what you need, then you can bless, pray, <laughs> bless. You can, I stumbled over this last week, I'm stumbling it over again this week. You can press play, and uh, we'll get started uh, with the worship service with you once again. The other announcement that I have this morning is I want to let you know that next Sunday morning, we will be having another in-person worship service. And so there will be more details if you're interested in coming to join us. It will be basically the same as what we did in August. Uh, we'll have it be safe for everyone. We'll allow you to come into the sanctuary if you want to worship in the sanctuary. If you feel safer worshiping in your vehicle in the parking lot, you can do that as well. But we hope that you'll come back and join us once again next Sunday morning for the in-person worship service that we'll be having here at South. Well, friends, this time, we'll go ahead and get started with the online worship. At this time, we're going to sing our opening hymn, which is, To God Be the Glory.
once again, want to encourage you to come and join us if you feel that it would be safe for you to do so. We do want to lift up in prayer those who are in hospice care. We want to remember those who have been in the hospital or rehabilitation. We want to lift up those who are battling cancer. We want to pray for those who are dealing with other ongoing health issues. And friends, as always, we want to lift up those who are on the front lines battling the COVID-19 pandemic, those that are trying to come up with the cure. And we do want to pray, as always, for unity in a divided nation. And our prayer is that we can be those bridge builders, that we can be those instruments of peace, that we can help to bring unity in a divided nation. Well, friends, at this time, we will sing our prayer hymn together. Our prayer hymn this morning is Jesus, keep me near the cross.
And again, thank you to all of you who have continued to faithfully support us uh, over the last six months. And friends, at this time, we will go ahead and sing the doxology together. Still, they were still 
just rub. And when Nehemiah heard about that, he was incredibly concerned. And so Nehemiah went to the king, new king this time, by the name of Artaxerxes and said, Artaxerxes, I know that I've got no right to ask you this, but would you be willing to let me go home and help my people to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem and to rebuild the city itself? And God moved the heart of Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes allowed Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem and to rebuild. That's where we left off last week. Today we're going to find out how long it took them to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem and then to rebuild the city itself. It took them 20 years to build the temple. How long is it going to take them to build everything else? If it took 20 years to build the temple, I mean, what's that mean? It's going to take like 100 years to rebuild the wall and the city itself? Let's find out. Let's take a look at Nehemiah chapter 6. We'll start with verse 15. We'll continue through chapter 9, verse 6. And this is a greatly, greatly condensed version of these four chapters. Starting with verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 15, it says, So the wall was completed in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the Levites were appointed. Now, the city of Jerusalem was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. Skipping ahead quite a bit in chapter 7. The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the temple servants, along with certain people, uh, of the rest of the Israelites settled in their towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon, and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. The Levites said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You gave life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. So, I realize that reading that, it seems a little bit disjointed, uh, but there is a lot of material to cover from Nehemiah chapter 6 through the end of the book of Nehemiah. I just wanted to get the high points. So very quickly, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all tracking with this, let me just talk through everything we just covered, and I'll even fill in a few of the gaps for you. So again, we wanted to know how long it was going to take them to build the wall around Jerusalem. It took them 52 days. It took them 20 years to build the temple. It took them 52 days to build the wall. Because I think they had Nehemiah there to lead them. That certainly helped. They had adversaries who were going to try to hurt them if they could. And so for a number of reasons, they got that wall built in 52 days. And it tells us there in verse 16 of chapter 6 that at this point, when all their adversaries that have been persecuting their rebuilding effort now for generations and generations and generations, when the adversaries see that the wall has gone up in 52 days, they just decide, well, obviously God is on their side. And at this point, their adversaries basically stopped the persecution. And so then, we find out in chapter 7, that once the walls are in place, Nehemiah looks around the city of Jerusalem and realizes, 
Well, there's nobody in the city. <laughs> there's, there's hardly anybody who's living in the city. And why? Well, because the city was still in rubble. I don't want to live in rubble. You don't want to live in rubble. And so Nehemiah says, it's time for us to rebuild the city itself. And so that's what they do. And it tells us that it took them about seven months to rebuild the city itself, which again, that's pretty incredible. The temple took 20 years, the wall around the entire city took 52 days, and to rebuild the city itself, it took them about seven months. So, once they've got the city rebuilt, everybody moves back into Jerusalem. We've got a list of people there that moved back in in verse 73. And then it tells us that they want Ezra to come and to read the law to them. And so that's what Ezra does. And in chapter 8, verse 3, it says that Ezra read the law from daybreak until noon. So what do you think daybreak was? Let's just say for the sake of argument, daybreak was 6.30 a.m. So that means that Ezra was reading to them from 6.30 in the morning until noon, five and a half hours. So I wanted to let you know, here at Southview, we're going to start a new service on the first day of the month. <laughs> Where you come to the church on the first day of the month at daybreak, and then I will read the Bible to you from daybreak until noon. Uh, or maybe Cheryl McMurtry will do that for you. I haven't decided quite yet. We'll work out all the details, but we'll see you on the 1st of October. Can't wait. <laughs> Can you imagine five and a half hours? But the people ate it up. These people loved it. It says that they listened attentively. <laughs> Can you imagine people sitting out in these pews listening attentively as I read the Bible for five and a half hours? I mean, it's, it's kind of hard for me to imagine. Maybe not impossible, but uh, that, would be, that would be a little bit of a stretch. And then it tells us that the, the people who were their leaders at this point, so Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levite priests, that they see that as Ezra is reading the law to them, is reading God's word to them, that they're weeping. Why were they weeping? Well, I think for a lot of these Hebrew people, that their entire lives were built around the law. For many of them, they had probably never actually heard it before. Because keep in mind, 2,500 years ago, they didn't have a copy of the Bible. 2,500 years ago, they had no reading ability or very little reading ability, and even if they did, they couldn't go and have their own copy of the Bible. The only time they ever would have heard it would have been in a synagogue service. And so for a lot of these people, this was probably the first time that they were hearing the law, God's word, that their entire lives were based around. And when you realize that, then it's kind of easy to understand why some of them were probably weeping. But the leaders say, don't weep. This isn't a day for tears. And the Levites say in chapter 9, instead, I want you to stand up and we're going to worship together. And that's exactly what they do. And the end of the passage that you have on your sermon notes is the response of worship that they did, kind of like we did earlier in the service. If you're paying close attention, you probably noticed that our response of reading earlier in the service today is the same exact thing that they were doing 2,500 years ago. Pretty cool. So, so that's how we're going to wrap up with the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But what I want to do right now is I want us to talk about what this passage teaches us that we should do in critical moments. Because again, Nehemiah, when he heard that Jerusalem had been sitting there just wide open, no walls, the cities in ruins had been sitting there at that point for 70 years. Well, Nehemiah knew that it was just a matter of time before something bad happened. Nehemiah, Nehemiah knew that the moment was critical for them to act. So what should we do in critical moments? Well, I think that this passage teaches us several things that we do. 
And the first thing that we should do in a critical moment is we must follow our leaders. We must follow our leaders. In this passage, we see the leadership of Nehemiah. We see the leadership of Ezra. We see the leadership of the Levite priests. And one of the things that we haven't really had a chance to talk about in the sermon series itself, although I've mentioned it in the daily Bible studies, is that we also had two of the well-known Old Testament prophets who were working alongside of Nehemiah and Ezra at this time, including Haggai and Zechariah. So you had good leadership that the Hebrew people in Jerusalem were receiving at this point in their history. And friends, I wonder what would have happened 2,500 years ago when Nehemiah showed up and said, you guys, you spent 20 years rebuilding the temple, but there's no wall around the city, and the city itself is a mess. Nobody lives here. We've got to fix this. I wonder what would have happened if half of the people who were there said, well, you know, that Nehemiah is a Republican, and I'm a Republican, so I'm not going to listen to anything he says. <laughs> what if half the people had said the opposite? Well, that Nehemiah, he is a Republican, and I'm a Republican, so I'm not going to listen to anything he says. Nobody said that 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago, they said, he's right. We are just asking for trouble. And they all came together and they did what needed to be done. And friends, obviously, we are in a place in American society where we're kind of stuck right now. And I think it's just a good reminder for all of us that sometimes we need to look beyond whatever our political allegiances might be to just do the right thing and to just get the jobs done. Friends, one of the daily devotions that uh, I wrote this past week, some of you might have read it, uh, was titled, Lead, Follow, or dot, dot, dot. And there are moments in our lives when God calls us to lead. God clearly called Nehemiah to lead, clearly. But there are also moments in our lives when God calls us to be good followers. And thank goodness, 2,500 years ago, the Hebrew people living in Jerusalem, the handful of them that were there, decided that they were going to be good followers and that they would follow Nehemiah's leadership. Friends, that's what we need to do at moments in our lives. We need to lead or we need to follow. But we can't do nothing. If we do nothing, we're not helping anyone. So that's the first thing that we should do in critical moments, is follow our leaders. The second thing we should do is in critical moments, we must look to God's word for guidance. In critical moments, we must look to God's word for guidance. Because that's what they did, again, 2,500 years ago. As soon as they got the walls built, as soon as they got the city rebuilt, they said, all right, we've got the critical things taken care of now. For some of them, for the very first time, they got to hear God's word that their whole life, their whole culture was built around. And friends, this book is our guide for life and for faith. And the wisdom contained in this book is just incredible. You've heard me say it before, you'll hear me say it again, I'm a Bible nerd. I love this book. And I hope that you feel at least somewhat the same way. I, maybe you don't have to consider yourself a Bible nerd, but I hope that you look to this book for your guidance for life and faith as well. And friends, I don't know this book inside and out. Just this morning, uh, Mark, who sang earlier in the service, he said, hey, Pastor Kerry, isn't there one of the Old Testament prophets that's known as the son of dust? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and so I had to Google it, and sure enough, one of the Old Testament prophets, Ezekiel, 
is known as the son of dust. Didn't know that before. I know that now. Thanks to my friend Mark. There's still so much that I need to learn about this book. And so much that all of us need to learn about this book. So that is the second thing that we should do in critical moments. And the third thing that we should do in critical moments is this. In critical moments, we must remember that God is helping us. In critical moments, we must remember that God is helping us. Again, in this passage, towards the very start of the passage, in Nehemiah 6, verse 16, it tells us that after the adversaries of Hebrews, who had been giving them grief and had been physically threatening them now, for years and years and years and years, that when it finally becomes clear to them that God is on the Hebrews' side, that's when they went, oh, all right, well, if God is clearly on their side, then maybe we better step back. Maybe we better leave them alone before we get ourselves in serious trouble. And friends, God is always helping us, whether we realize it or not. I firmly believe that. I believe that God helps every single one of us every single day in ways that are unseen. Friends, I hope that as we wrap up this sermon series, that we can be inspired by what we've seen in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. When you consider what happened with the Hebrews returning and rebuilding the temple, and then taking care of everything else, and then looking up to God, and looking to God's Word. I think that there are many, if not all, of those things that we should be doing now, in the year 2020, in the middle of this terrible global pandemic. I hope that we will do our part, that we will lead if God's calling us to lead, and if we're not being called to lead, then we should be good followers. I hope that we will continue to look to God's Word. And I hope that we will continue to put our trust in God because I think that God is helping us. We may not see it necessarily every single day, but I firmly believe that God is helping us and that God will see us through this. Well, friends, at this time, as we think about the ways in which God has helped us over the course of human history, of course, one of the most prominent ways in which God has helped us was at the cross 2,000 years ago. And so as we prepare to gather around the Lord's table, we're going to sing our communion hymn together. And our communion hymn this morning is, Here at the Table, Lord.
Friends, we are reminded that we should examine our hearts before we eat the bread and drink the cup. So let us take the next few moments for silent reflection. Dear God, we stand in awe and wonder when we consider the sacrifice Jesus Christ made on the cross, that his body was broken, his blood spilled, that, what, that we might know your life and love. As we come to this table and remember in the eating of this bread and the drinking of this cup, your great sacrifice, we offer to you our sacrifices, our weak bodies, our divided minds, our broken spirits, we know that you can take us in our brokenness and transform us into a living sacrifice, good and acceptable, that Christ's love may be seen in our daily lives. We pray in the name of the one whose bread we eat and cup we drink. Amen. Amen. Friends, those of you who are worshiping with us online this morning, you are encouraged to take of your communion elements at this time. Time we will sing our closing hymn together. Our closing hymn this morning is There is a Balm in Gilead.
give us leaders, God will give us direction, and God will help us behind the scenes. Amen.